Welcome to Players Only, your backstage pass behind the scenes of today's PC and video game industry. I'm Scott Steinberg, and is it just us, or does it seem like everybody's getting in the game today? Men, women, young, old? We take a closer look at the changing face of video games, and whether or not the old stereotypes still stand. The stereotypical gamer fact does not match the usual stereotype, you know, so the stereotype is a kind of young, pimply male stuck in the basement, when in fact, you know, that's, that's well, certainly there's a lot of those that are playing games, no doubt about it, uh, but, but it's actually much broader than that. Well, first of all, I have been outside recently, I, and I do, I bathe, I mean, not today, or, <laughs> gamers aren't shut-ins, they're just like everyone else, I mean, a lot of technical people, are, they're from all walks of life, our hardcore gamers, they tend to be in their 30s, they tend to be male, uh, they have jobs, but I wouldn't call them shut-ins. Nursing homes have weeds, they have bowling tournaments, they have all kinds of games happening there, you have kids playing with adults. They have weekend parties where they hook up their game systems and have multiplayer bashes, you know, all night. One of the reasons why you see such a broad appeal is games run the gamut of entertainment. And it's everything from my SAT coach up through uh, the, the games that are more traditionally associated with our industry, and those are very powerful big movers like Grand Theft Auto 4 or Halo. Who's playing games? Who's not, right? I mean, it's, it's weird that the, the group on EA Online spend more hours per week than World of Warcraft players, and they're women 35 to 50. My, my mom's not playing, but everybody else is. Some of the games we've seen on DS, uh, some of the brain games and so on, uh, has also sort of opened up the market. Games like Rock Band and Guitar Hero uh, also have really opened up uh, the, you know, the game gaming audience to people who don't traditionally uh, play games. It's funny, uh, I was talking with a friend who uh, said that uh, his girlfriend, you know, hates games, doesn't play games, but she does the rock band. It's like, well, you know, we were asking, you know, do, do you play? Oh, no, 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 I don't play games, I just do the rock band. Developers, I think, are cognizant of the fact that gamers aren't just young men, but they still are sort of stuck, I think, in that rut. And they, of course, that's the audience they know. So as that becomes female gamers and minority gamers become a bigger part of the pie, they will both become a louder audience and an audience that wants to be served separately, but also will start getting more into game development and we'll see more games coming from them, which means it will speak to you know that audience. So why the sudden shift in audience and since when is it cool to be a geek? Back in the day when two percent of people, you know, were computer users. You know, it's pretty different from a world where ninety percent of people are computer users. I think it's not so much that geeks are more in favor as much as it is, they're, they're just less out of favor. So it's just a relative thing. It makes it seem like geekiness isn't, isn't, uh, is, is cool because it's less uncool than it used to be. I think these days games are the sort of dominant form of entertainment. And um, you have a generation of people who have grown up kind of you know now knowing games as their primary form of entertainment. And for them in the future, it's gonna be their primary form of expression. So I really just think it has to do with the evolution of games. Uh, kind of no matter where you turn in life, there's a device that's able to play games of one, you know, of one scale or another. You've got the high-end consoles, PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and Wii, and then you've got the handheld devices, DS and PSP, and then iPhone, and phones, and peripherals, and so there's millions of opportunities. MMOs, free-to-play flash games, played on portals like Miniclip and Congregate and Addicting Games. And so there's opportunities for people to consume content and also there's opportunities to develop content. I think we're seeing an expansion in the games audience in part because we're finally making games that aren't the same old, same old things made for, you know, teenage guys, honestly. With the growth of games in casual genres, the web has been a huge driver there. Uh, even adventure games are back, right? We've seen a huge expansion in terms of audience appeal to women, to older folks with things like Brain Age and We Fit and so on and even to kids in ways that hadn't been there before because the cost of free-to-play games has opened up new markets. The game industry is really uh, much more than an industry, it's an ecosystem. At the center of that ecosystem is what you would call traditionally the mainstream game industry, which is you know, your Xbox games and the Wii and PlayStation and so the, you know, the normal stuff you can go to the store and see on the shelf. But within the ecosystem, sort of beyond that center, there's all kinds of other stuff that's happening. Whether it's MMOs or casual games or iPhone stuff or online only, indie stuff or art house stuff or some of the academic research stuff and serious games and alternate reality games and mixed reality. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that's sort of percolating within the ecosystem. We're getting away from 
specific genres of gaming and engaging more different types of people and different types of um, way in which people play, like Guitar Hero and, and Rock Band and those. I have accountants that we work with in the association who all of a sudden consider themselves gamers because they just play one of those games casually at parties. Some titles skew you know, younger and female, others skew male and older, but in terms of your average gamer, it's your average person on the street, which is kind of cool. Still, why is it important now for everyone to stand up and let their voice be heard? We asked insiders, how are the politics of games changing? Sometimes people still talk about people who play video games as uneducated, as slackers, not really interested in what's happening in the real world, so to speak. Many of the games today actually address political issues. Video games uh, run the gamut of American entertainment and they appeal to all stratifications of society. So when you say you're going to attack video games, you're attacking everyone. The video game playing public is entitled to play the games they enjoy. It's a First Amendment based understanding that, hey look, this is a great uh, product, it's great entertainment, it's legitimate, and I have a right to it. And as publishers, it's very important because it's the same uh, idea. Is there's freedoms in this country, far greater than around the world, to say, I've got a game, it may have some elements in it that challenge misconceptions in our society, and I'm going to make it, and I'm going to put it out there for the public to consume, and the public will determine whether the game's um, uh, a success or a failure. It's important for people to consider getting involved, uh, whether it's joining the Entertainment Consumers Association or just lending their voice to what's going on uh, legislatively, because they need to, to find out what the issues are, find out how it impacts them, Clearly they'll be able to distinguish what's important to them from what's not, and what's important, you don't want to delegate that responsibility for standing up for yourself to someone else. Uh, that just empowers them. I think there are two ways of looking at how politicians um, uh, attack video games. The past was, if you attack video games, you got a big headline in your newspaper, and that ink drove attention to you as a candidate and then that helped reinforce your political stature. What we're seeing today is a smarter media that says, you know what, there are a lot of good things going on around video games, like the average wage is $92,000 a year in our industry. And we're seeing many states that are interested in attracting our industry as opposed to singling us out for unconstitutional punishment. Want to cast your vote for gaming? Tune in next week for another exciting episode of Players Only.